Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a, a nice <laughs> lunch of good food and discussion, meeting new people. I know I met about 10 new people during uh, the break, all of whom I'm gonna pull into the project. Uh, I'm Dorothy Roberts. I'm a professor here at Penn in law, Africana Studies and Sociology, and the director of the Penn Program on Race, Science, and Society, which is co sponsoring this symposium. And I'm also a member of the Penn and Slavery Working Group. And I'm really, really excited to moderate this panel on uh, slavery and medicine and the role of Penn in promoting that connection, that entanglement between slavery and medicine. You've heard a lot about it already beginning yesterday at the round table and all the, the wonderful presentations that we had from students today. Uh, it's undeniable that Penn Medicine trained many of the doctors who returned to the South and practiced slave medicine, whether, as we discussed, it was a separate area of practice or whether it was part of their general practice, but it was based on these ideas of separate humanity, separate bodies, and the justification for slavery rooted in these beliefs in biological difference and the belief that black people had pathological bodies that required them to be under the control of white people. Uh, we've also seen how those ideas continue to circulate in medical practice and research and policy and education today. And that is what I hope to explore in this panel this afternoon, building on what we talked about so far, but now with four of the absolutely leading experts on the topic of slavery and medicine. I am just so thrilled to have these four speakers here today to talk about their work. They are all have studied in depth this topic and when we had our conference call to discuss the order of presentations, it was, it was so thrilling to think about what they each had to offer to this story uh, in the past and continuing, continuing into the future. So without further ado, let me introduce very briefly the speakers. There are longer bios in the programs you should have received and you can refer to those, but just a couple lines on each one to try to capture the depth of their knowledge in uh, this field. Uh, and I will begin from your left to right, and this will be the order in which they'll speak as well. Uh, each one will speak for about 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll have a little discussion amongst ourselves, and then we'll open up for discussion with all of you. So. Uh, first, we have Shawande Mustakim, who is an associate professor of history and of African and African American studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Her first book, Slavery at Sea, Terror, Sex, and Sickness in the Middle Passage. Let me repeat that. Yeah, I'll hold it. <laughs> Let me repeat that. <laughs> Slavery at Sea. Terror, Sex, and Sickness in the Middle Passage, published by University of Illinois Press in 2016. It won the 2017 Wesley Logan Prize, sponsored by the American Historical Association and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Next, see what I'm talking about? <laughs> Next, Rana A. Hogarth is an assistant professor of history at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and she is the author of Medicalizing Blackness, Making Racial Difference in the Atlantic World. Medicalizing Blackness, that's what we're talking about. Making Racial Difference in the Atlantic World, uh, published by University of North Carolina Press, 2017. She holds a PhD in history with a, connect, a concentration in history of science, history of medicine from Yale University. She also holds an MHS in health policy from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Okay, 
Next, <laughs> we have Dinah Ramey Berry, who is the Oliver H. Radke Regents Professor of History at the University of Texas at Austin. She's the award-winning author and editor of five books and several scholarly articles. Her recent book, The Price of Their Pound of Flesh, The Value of the Enslaved from Womb to the Grave in the Building of a Nation. I repeat, the price of their pound of flesh, the value of the enslaved, from womb to the grave in the building of a nation. It's a powerful title published by Beacon in 2017. And that's been awarded three book awards, including the 2018 Hamilton Book Prize from the University Co-op for the best book among UT Austin faculty, the 2018 Best Book Prize from the Society of the History of Early American Republic, and the Phyllis Wheatley Award for Scholarly Research from the Sons and Daughters of the U.S. Middle Passage. And last but not least, we have Christopher D. E. Willoughby, a historian and scholar in residence at the Labadus Center for the Historical Analysis of Transatlantic Slavery at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York City. He's currently completing a book based on his dissertation, which is based on years of archival research here at University of Pennsylvania. I think uh, Dr. Brown referred to his study of all these medical theses coming out of Penn's Medical School, and he's completing a book on that uh, uh, the History of Racial Science and Slavery in American Medical Schools, which is under advanced contract with the University of North Carolina Press. So we look forward to that book winning awards and joining this uh, prominent group of books on this topic. And so I will turn it over to you, Dr. Mustakim, to begin your presentation. Thanks. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Are you awake? Are you full? Are you ready to talk about slavery? Really? And medicine? Well, I'm here to get us there. But I really am excited to be here. It is truly an honor to be here and to be a part of these conversations because it's been an ongoing rich dialogue for us to really look at the past, why it matters, and then to think about the future and what it means to all of us, not just within the institution of a university, but also the public as well in thinking about the making and the meanings of history. So again, it's we're at a very pivotal point, not only within this century, but just in time that now we're reckoning with the past. And over these years, I've been writing and teaching slavery for now almost, golly, 19 years, 20 years. Um, and through it, I've moved through different institutions that are now putting the mirror up to themselves and beginning to look at where and how that they have this place in the past. So um, I'll get into how there's a bigger sort of connection, although right now it may not seem like I have a connection to Penn, but yet the medical side of it that is there. But I want to open with a story, because I like stories, and I like to pull you in. So we're going to start there, and then afterwards I'm going to open up um, and talk more about the book a little bit, but also how we think about the future. On June 15, 1791, sailor John Cranston gave testimony concerning a Negro woman said to have been thrown overboard off of an American slave vessel, Polly. He detailed the complex outplay of events, foregrounding the actions of Rhode Island slave trader and ship captain James DeWolf in the ensuing murder. Cranston's recollections reinforced the power that DeWolf held as master over both captives and sailors within the open sea. The locus of white male power, however, lies most prominently with the life of an enslaved black woman, weakened by smallpox, whose shipboard presence led to her mistreatment and also being seen as a threat to the ship's voyage and envisioned future profits, thereby facilitating her death and complicating meanings on the body, diseased and female, sold into the global slave market, transported overseas, and thus unable to be returned to Africa. Quote, in the course of three or four days, her disorder increased so as to become offensive and render it dangerous for her to remain on board. Alarmed by her continued weakness, 
DeWolf called an emergency meeting with the vessel's crew to consider the most effective strategy for a black woman who's left in the archives simply as a Negro wench. So we don't quite have a name. We have the renaming and very racialized in that way. But this woman's medical condition, her final stay aboard the poly mattered. So playing upon the threat of contamination, DeWolf emphasized, quote, if we keep the slave here, she will give it to the rest, both sailors and those held captive, thereby creating greater opportunity in his mind for an enslaved insurrection. So within an estimated two months left in their voyage, DeWolf reasoned that being unable to, quote, afford any effectual medical assistance if the smallpox spread, Quote, the Negroes, they would then have to be confined in the hold where the excessive heat would increase the effects of this disease. The woman, therefore, had to be permanently removed. Captain Jim chose to act upon what he envisioned as the only option at his seafaring disposal, querying the men if they, quote, were willing to heave the woman overboard. It generated, in fact, several unsatisfactory responses counter to his deadly thoughts, yet, in his mind, quote, no alternative was left to save the crew and the cargo from the ensuing disease, but to throw this one so dangerously infected overboard off the poly. The bonded woman's deadly fate loomed in his mind, where in which he, quote, talked of it one or two times the day before she was thrown overboard. Invoking his power as shipmaster, DeWolf ordered another sailor, Thomas Corton, to go up with him to the woman's separate holding. They had put her in quarantine and moved her to a separate part of the ship. And there, the two men, quote, lashed her in a chair, tied a mask around her eyes and mouth, plausibly to prevent any immediate bodily contamination, as well as to hinder her from seeing or disrupting the men from restricting her movements and all that would play out. So with, quote, a tackled hook upon the slings around the chair, this permitted DeWolf and Gordon to maneuver her down to the hands of four sailors awaiting below. And amidst the woman's removal off ship, each of these men became collective accessories in her forthcoming overthrow. And reinforcing superiority all over, the fundamental basis of Captain Jim's use of these four men rested on the practical dimension of removing the bondwoman off ship, which in, 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 indelibly would require many hands. Following transfer to the next level of the vessel, quote, she was landed in the rails and lowered down by two sailors. As they moved the captive female off the poly, her dangling body swayed right forward and left thence until she was dropped into the oceanic waters beneath. Once fully immersed in the makeshift watery grave, the sailors attested that, quote, she hollered after she was down, demonstrating that despite being enfeebled, she was very much alive. Now, according to Stockman and Clannon, the jettison incident was far from being accompanied with malice or wantonness in its intentions against the woman. Instead, the circumstances at hand compelled DeWolf and the crew, quote, to adopt this disagreeable alternative as the only method available to claim the necessary relief, of course, for themselves. So at the moment of discovery, what we're finding is that you see this othering of this woman. It moved her from the status of exploitable commodity, reinforcing racial differences that further marked her body. And so in that way, she transformed her body, then transformed into something shameful and revolting and essentially alienating that they did not want her there. So we may never really know what the participating seamen replay the jettison if or how, they replayed this jettison incident in their minds or psychologically suppressed the final moments of her time aboard. Yet the alleged compulsory nature of the bond woman's violent removal does not diminish the possibility of the effect left upon, again, the crewmen, the entire voyage, and also her shipmates who, once they would have come up above board, they would have noticed that they had lost a, a, um, a shipmate. However, on the other hand, for DeWolf, unfazed by the female's forcible homicidal disappearance, quote, very near half an hour, in fact, after the poly sailed onward from her deserted body, a nearby sailor overheard him remark, quote, he was sorry he, he, was sorry he lost so good a chair. This story 
and this woman's life and death has lived with me. Now for almost 16 years, and this spectacle of murder and homicidal murder to tie someone's down, someone down to a chair, lower them, and then essentially throw them off of a ship. It haunted me because in looking at the larger cycle of violence, and it really actually didn't haunt me, I would say that in living with, because I'm not haunted by it, I'm not afraid of it, I'm not afraid in talking about this, but yet it's realizing that her story was nowhere in the narratives of medical history. And yet, or even of slavery in and of itself, because we conflate black, adult black men as the representative for all African-Americans or all black people, and that's not the case. And so in, I share this woman's story foremost because she is the anchor. She has been. In fact, I took her story out of my now published book um, when it was a dissertation, knowing that it needed to stand on its own. But then... As time went on, it allowed me to see more of this enslaved world and more the medical side of it. Because in sharing this woman's story, I share it because it prominently forces us to critically reconsider a lot of things. The objectification and mistreatment of captive black bodies, sound and diseased, who were confined within these spaces of the Atlantic. And it also foregrounds the critical point that in remembering slavery, it's not just about the taking of prime slaves, and to be honest with you, then the leaving of so-called refused slaves. And I point that out because in creating sometimes these perfect memories, we make the enslaved people fit a certain model. And so in that way, we forget the disease. We forget the disabled. We forget the children. We forget the teenagers. We forget females because we then are conflating slavery, again, with these adult black males. And so yet when we broaden the narrative, and the gaze to fully consider the fate of all of those who passed coastal inspection, found themselves sold and transplanted aboard private ships, then we can begin to really go deeper to look at who were these goods, these human goods that were imported to support desires of future sales and plantation needs. So I want to pull back now and actually direct it to my book because for some people, you may be asking, okay, Middle Passage, how does this connect with Penn? How does this connect with a broader conversation on medicine? And, and yet within my book, it very much connects. Because I argued about when I was trying to really understand the slave trade in this for over 400 centuries, we're having, not 400 centuries, but four, over four centuries. Um, I, it's how do, what meaning do we make of it? You can say the slave trade, but what does that mean? And so what I did is I redefined it as exactly what it is. One, it is human. Humans created that, and it was fueled and sponsored and went on. So I argue that this encompasses not just this case, but the Middle Passage and the whole cycle, the human manufacturing system. And so with that, what I did is I, I went there, to the business model at least, and I created this so, sort of, I guess, you know, more of a socioeconomic view to say that here is where we see the making and the unmaking of enslaved people. And that's predicated upon capture, warehousing, say, warehousing transport, and delivery. I called my father at the time because he used to work for a manufacturing company. And then everything became very clear in terms of how we locate slavery and all of its making and evolution solely within plantations and now within medical halls. But yet we have to look at where did it begin? It didn't just begin here, it didn't begin in the South. It began in this sense and was made and solidified in these racialized ideas aboard slave ships. So within the book, I talk about not just sailors and enslaved people and ship captains, but also including slave ship surgeons. And so I went to 25 archives across the world in order to tell this story and to make it as bloody as possible, but also, because I have, a, um, and the medical basis is very much woven throughout. So when I go back to, and I was thinking about the panel and looking at the title of it with slavery and medicine and looking at what is Penn's role, and then I begin to think their role was just like Harvard. Their role was just like Brown. Their role is just like all of these other institutions that benefited. They benefited from the racialized ideas that would have allowed the slave trade to continue. But more importantly, they're the recipient of black bodies, both life and death, and then to 
teach and remake a whole future or continue to make these futures based upon the idea of exploiting the black body. And so again, um, when I think about the bigger narrative, we're at a place where the medical conversations are coming up slowly. In fact, I was just telling Dr. Barry, because in fact, I was her first PhD student, so we got a little history going on. Um, that said, I was one of those very random graduate students who asked for an extra comp, how dare I? And I added in, <laughs> oh no, I added in medical history because I knew, I knew the future was coming. And guess what, we're here, we're here. <laughs> We know Dr. Bear. <laughs> so when you're looking at where do the conversations need to go, we the medical side of it has been overlooked. If I were to say two areas, medical and maritime histories, it's like race doesn't even matter in the sense of their separate historiographies. They become where we can go to a conference and then for a long time there would not be the, the connection of these fields. But in using the book, I demanded and basically push, I'm pushing this narrative into these fields so that way we can look at all the various makings of this institution. But yet, there's a cost to not talking about it. There's a cost, we're already dealing with it now. That's why we have medical students that still have these ideas racially about one being better than the other because we're not talking about it, because we allow that, because it might even be an elective. If we're lucky, if it's even being taught in medical school, have we even thought about undergraduates? No, because we wanna wait, we wanna wait later, but you have to start earlier. So anyway, when, I, when I'm thinking about the cost, one of the biggest costs that I learned from this woman and telling her story is that when we don't talk about it, then black history is folklorized. Oh, that didn't happen. Oh, that was just one little incident. Oh, you made it up. So I have confronted American audiences and really seen race in a whole new way that to have a diseased black woman and how she was treated but how people will respond to the story in addition to it coming from me as an African-American woman to be writing about slavery and to have access to this history, is that again, if you don't talk about it, then it'll be left at one incident, oh, and, and then denying that it really ever existed. So then we deny the trauma, we deny the pain, and we deny these, these human, very human moments. So then for me, because I'm very solution-oriented, we can talk all day, mm -hmm. what are we doing? The question is, what do we do, but what do we do that's long-lasting? Can we really solve it? We can't, but yet we can begin. It isn't a one-step solution. However, me being bold as I am, I developed a course for undergrads. I actually developed when I was in grad school. And it's titled, in fact, I'll, um, I'll pull it up in just a second because I want you all to see the description. But it's groundbreaking because I'm almost certain it's the only undergraduate course in the country or anywhere it's titled Medicine, Healing, and Experimentation in the Contours of Black History. But first, I'll let you look at the, the description. Um, and this, I teach it every year. I taught it last fall, I'll teach it next fall, and it attracts all kinds of students. But one thing that I'll tell you that's been interesting, again, I love pop culture, love TV. There is a show that I now require students to watch, and it has been fundamental for students to essentially see history as history, even if in a visual form, there is a show that stars Clive Owens that's called The Nick. I have assigned that now for at least, well, I don't know, three, four years, and every single student, they're grateful because then you're being forced to look at the operation of medical practice as well as looking at the racial differences separating to have a black um, hospital in one part of, or to be overlooked and denied. So in that way, when we think about the how, it's we're doing exactly like how this conference is. When you, you come at it from a variety of themes and angles to engage the next generation. And I'll end here and just say that this, this is my attempt to begin to help empower and embolden us to know even more and moving in the future. And I'm happy to talk more about any of this and of course the book and the article, whatever you want. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh.
can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, so one, um, I'd like to echo the thanks um, for being invited to participate in this conversation and to sort of share space with the variety of scholars um, that I've encountered here. Um, I'd also like to just take a moment to um, actually commend the undergraduate panel from this morning. Um, I think their work is exemplary, um, and I was extremely gratified to um, see how um, to see how what they have presented really will dovetail, I think, with the conversations we'll have um, later this afternoon. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little bit, um, and I hope I hope it won't bore you, but um, I will warn you that there is um, going to be a description that um, many might find extremely disturbing. So um, I'll, I'll try my best. <clears throat> Glancing through a box of Benjamin Rush's papers at the Library Company of Philadelphia, I lingered over the typed page identifying the contents. Quote, lectures on pathology, series three, box three. Contents of local diseases, of the black color of the African, of the proximate cause of death, end quote. To be honest, um, I was not at all surprised to find black skin color included in Rush's writings on pathology as a historian who researches medical and scientific constructions of race from the 18th century to the present day, I'm actually not surprised by many of the theories put forth by renowned physicians and natural scientists regarding human difference. Indeed, not those that traffic in a vocabulary that pathologize black people's bodies. Benjamin Rush, whose many claims to fame include being a signer of the Declaration of Independence, an abolitionist, a respected physician, a patriot, was also one of the many scientists who sought to answer the question why is black skin black? Rush approached the answer to this question by suggesting that black skin was in fact a manifestation of leprosy, something that Brooke alluded to in her presentation this morning. We can see the fragments of this theory in his lecture notes, but it appears more fully formed in his essay, Observations Intended to Favor a Supposition that the Black Color, as it is called in Negroes, is the leprosy, which he published in the Transactions of the American Philosophical Society in 1799. Russia's essay has not escaped the analytical gaze of contemporary scholars, meaning that the cloud of obscurity that once covered it is lifting. Exemplary work by Carrie Ann Yakota, Eric Herschel, to name but a few scholars, rely on this text to complicate Russia's relationship to race, reframe the role of science in anti-slavery discourse, and locate the limitations black people faced in the early republic because of these pervasive medical ideas about their bodies. So today I'd like to build upon that work but I'd like to focus more explicitly on blackness as a driver of the scientific method, the thing that frames the research question. Now, before I go any further, I'd like to say a few, few things about Rush in relation to his view on black skin. Rush was no crackpot, charlatan, or quack. He earned his first degree from Princeton. He briefly apprenticed himself to a leading local physician in Philadelphia before beginning his formal education at the University of Edinburgh in 1766. At the time, the University of Edinburgh was a premier institution for medical education. In the American 18th century context, many could call themselves a doctor, but not all would have had the formal training from a respected institution, which means that Rush was more of an exception and not necessarily the rule. More to the point, Rush's interest in black skin was not the product of some idiosyncratic preoccupation. Throughout the 18th century, in scientific circles in Europe and North America, there was a broad institutional support for understanding the origins of blackness. For example, in 1741, the Academy of Bordeaux called for a competition amongst its elite natural philosophers and physicians to find the most plausible explanation for blackness, and the best essay actually received a prize. There is much that we can say about Rush's suppositions about black skin. <coughs> For the duration of this brief talk, I want to focus on the relationship between scientific inquiries into blackness and the harm it has done to black people's bodies. This kind of harm was manifest in both theories of blackness and in practical settings. It is replete in published scientific writings left behind by Benjamin Rush and other well-trained, well-intentioned white physicians, who I will discuss in just a moment. I use Rush and his contemporaries to illustrate a kind of taken-for-granted anti-blackness that was present in scientific pursuits of learned men who attempted to make sense of the differences they observed between black and white bodies. Rush's theory was certainly unique, but it was actually par for the course with respect to theories designed to explain blackness. It was hardly unusual for a scientist in the 18th century, usually white and usually male, to view blackness as a problem or a thing that needed explanation. 
In other words, Rush's view of black skin as leprosy is representative of a kind of anti-black ethos that is present in scientific knowledge production or that has been present in scientific knowledge production for centuries. In this context, I use anti-black in the literal sense of the word, hostile towards black people, to refer to textual and material subjugation of black people's bodies in medical and scientific writings. Here I highlight instances of anti-blackness that occurred on the cusp of the modern formation of the term race, that is to say before it referred to distinct types of humans based on phenotype. Anti-blackness was and is manifest in a number of ways in medical and scientific discourse, and it's actually quite easy to recognize in the historical record. I often think of it as the moment in which a black person's body becomes the research question and not just the object of contempt and the recipient of denigrating statements. Bearing this in mind helps us to broaden how scholars might think about the relationship between anti-blackness and the production of knowledge during the era of slavery. Black people's bodies were defined as inferior, incapable of self-government, or lacking depth of intellectual capacity and brutish. That said, anti-blackness need not be wielded by those who benefited from slavery directly. Rush <coughs> did eventually free his slave, was opposed to slavery. For Rush, black skin was a problem that contributed to the negative view that many whites held towards black people. By framing black skin as a pathology, Rush saw a way around the negative views. If one could cure blackness, then one could get rid of the problem it posed. For Rush, this process of treating blackness could only happen gradually over time, with exposure to better living conditions, a temperate and industrious way of life, and an end to slavery. In this way, Rush thought that black people could both be improved materially, um, literally their bodies. Now, the leprosy thesis was actually partially derived from Rush's knowledge of a black man, Henry Moss, who was losing his pigment. We think it was possibly vitiligo. Um, and this part is sort of um, often neglected from, um, from, from the story, but there's another piece of Rush's leprosy theory that I think is even more neglected, and that is his readings of other physicians and their thoughts about black skin. In both his handwritten lecture notes and in his published essay on leprosy, Rush cited an experiment by the English physician and contemporary Thomas Beddoes, who aside from dabbling with gases in medical therapies is noting for having, quote, prevailed upon a Negro to introduce his arm into a large jar filled with fluid, end quote. The fluid in question was oxygenated muriatic acid, which is what we would now call hydrochloric acid. Mm -hmm. The reason, Beddoes wanted to see if he could permanently remove blackness. Mm -hmm. Beddoes' experiment, which is less well known than Rush's theory of black skin as leprosy, raises many troubling questions. It is evocative of a kind of bald, racialized power, the stuff of white supremacist science fiction. <coughs> the attempt by a white physician to eradicate black pigment from a black person's skin with acid. Mm -hmm. To be clear, Beddoes was not a mad doctor, nor did he only experiment on vulnerable populations. He, like many scientists of his day, actually experimented upon himself first. Now my interest here is less on Beddoes' actions and Rush's theories. Instead, my interest is in on the logic that drove Beddoes and Rush to contemplate the possible removal of black skin, and this is what holds my attention and hopefully yours. So to put it bluntly, the impulse to control and make sense of black people's bodies has become a feature, not an aberration of scientific knowledge production. This type of control remains intimately bound up in the ways that black people's bodies have been considered in scientific discourse in the 20th and 21st centuries. It remains a key component in the ways that black people's bodies continue to inhabit um, a space that is predicated on peculiarity in the white imagination. So I will focus on um, those elements um, for most of my talk and I'll conclude um, by gesturing towards how anti-blackness continues to inform biomedical research, medical practice, um, although it's probably in, we might say, less overt ways. So I'll start my discussion of Rush very briefly with a quote. Quote, Dr. Beddoes tells us that he has discharged the black wool of Negroes by infusing it with oxygenated muriatic acid and lessened it by some the same means in the hand of a Negro man, end quote. Now, it should be clear, as we've all learned, that Benjamin Rush um, is kind of famous for being opposed to slavery. He was sort of a champion of Republican virtue, and that slavery was indeed incompatible with his own worldview. Um, but his actions in life um, are indeed illustrative of a kind of compassion for the plight of black people in the United States that it still allowed him to hold the belief that black and white people lacked physiological parity. It's worth unpacking 
what it meant for him to, to link blank blackness with the biblical stigma attached to leprosy as a mark of immorality. It's equally important for us to acknowledge his anti-slavery stance alongside his implicit acceptance that black and white people were simply not equal. This is most clearly articulated in his essay on leprosy in which he lays bares the stakes of framing black skin as a pathology. And I'm quoting here, quote, to encourage attempts to cure the disease of the skin of Negroes, let us recollect that in succeeding in them, we shall produce a large portion of happiness in the world. We shall in the first place destroy one of the arguments in favor of enslaving the Negroes, for their color has been supposed to be by the ignorant uh, the mark, to mark them for divine um, judgment and by the learned to qualify them for labor in hot and unwholesome climates. Secondly, we shall greatly add to their happiness for however well they appear to be satisfied with their color, there are many proofs of their preferring that of white people. <laughs> Thus, in Rush's attempt to wield his medical expertise as a cudgel against slavery, we see his own ingrained Eurocentrism, foregrounded in the claim that blacks would prefer having white skin. We see how he placed the onus of slavery upon black people's already burdened bodies, as if it were just the presence of their skin that made them enslaved. Another po crucial point to consider is that Rush's theory of black skin as leprosy, which appeared in his lecture notes and in a published article, helped to crystallize associations between black skin and insensitivity to pain. Those suffering from leprosy were deemed morbidly insensitive to pain. Mm -hmm. A man in Rush's position enjoyed the ability to widely disseminate his ideas about blackness to generations of medical students. In the winter of 1793, before the fateful summer outbreak of the yellow fever epidemic, Rush reminded his students of the resilience of black patients when faced with suffering in a lecture he delivered at the University of Pennsylvania. Quote, a fact from Dr. Mosley of the indifference to which Negroes submit to operation in surgery in the West Indies. Even in this country, Negroes have been observed to handle fire without an emotion and not suffering from it like white people, end quote. Rush had no qualms in citing Dr. Benjamin Mosley, who was indeed an authority. He actually served as the Surgeon General of Jamaica and had plenty of experience treating both black and white people. So this example from Rush's lecture notes reveals how information about black bodies from afar easily found its way to American practitioners. It underscores this clear circulation of medical knowledge about black people's bodies that took place in this era. In other words, physicians then, as they do today, read the latest publications, cite their respected peers in all matters of health, and even do so on matters related to blackness, which is precisely what Rush did when he mentioned Dr. Beddoes. So now I'd like to briefly speak about um, Dr. Beddoes' experiment. And I'm quoting um, to begin this section. I had proposed to a distressed Negro to try and whiten part of his skin with oxygenated marine acid air. Thomas Beddoes, 1796. Uh, now I should say that Beddoes um, saw himself as a very radically democratic and egalitarian figure. Um, in 1799, Beddoes opened the Pneumatic Institute in Bristol uh, for that purpose. In 1802, it was actually repurposed as a preventive medical institution for the sick and drooping poor. Beddoes remained committed to improving the lives of many, at least as that's what he told himself. As he tried to generate new applicable knowledge to healing, Beddoes experimented with different kinds of gases, acids, and compounds on himself and others. And as historians of science have noted, this desire to experiment with the body was actually standard. Um, the body became an experimental device in and of itself. The body was, and I'm quoting here, an ideal site, an instrument of investigation that helped erode what we might assume as commonplace disciplinary boundaries in the laboratory. For Beddoes, who very much believed in the radical notion of de democratizing scientific knowledge, experimentation was indeed essential. Beddoes' interests in race, I should add, were actually tangential to his larger interest in um, manipulating gases to treat patients. So he was actually encouraged by peers to uh, experiment with the various ways that acid um, might be able to help with wound healing. Um, so this experimental ethos is uh, actually captured in his own um, 1796 treatise, Considerations on the Medicinal Use and Production of Factuous Airs. Um, and so I'm just gonna very briefly quote the experiment he performed on himself first. Um, this is Beddoes excuse me, experimenting with acid on his own hand. I applied a blister an inch long and a half an inch broad to the third finger on the left hand, cut away the scarf skin of the vesication and was sensible to the moment the air was admitted of a sharp, smarting pain. 
kept my finger in carbonic acid air, which was near half an hour on taking it out. The surface had a whitish appearance. The smarting returned. In an hour, the exposed skin was painful and looked angry. Now, he uh, conducted these experiments on three different persons. He does not list their name. And that's not, again, that is not unusual. Um, but when he decides to experiment upon an unnamed Negro subject, the research question changes. What had initially been a quest for a therapeutic knowledge about acids and wound care turned into an exercise in pushing the limits of chemistry to see if it could solve lingering questions about blackness. The entire premise of the experiment with Beddoes' unnamed Negro subject rested on the idea that through principles of chemistry, black skin might be erased. Beddoes undoubtedly took advantage of a context in which black people's bodies were already under scrutiny and <laughs> subjugation as he moved forward with this experiment. He was also not unfamiliar with the debates over Britain's slave trade, and he was aware of the numerous theories about the origins of black skin. If we are to take Beddoes' 1811 memoir, which was actually penned by one of his former assistants, John E. Stock, at face value, we learn that Beddoes was, quote, disposed to consider the African Negro as a distinct species from the native of Europe, end quote. But, as Stock points out, Beddoes, quote, depreciates any justification of that iniquitous commerce in which these oppressed beings were long object, end quote. So he was opposed to the slave trade, but, you know, felt that he could still experiment on black people. So I'm going to now go into the vivid detail about the experimentation. Um, I just want to forewarn audience members. And this is, again, quoted from his published um, considerations on the medicinal use and production of factuous heirs. Quote, at Oxford in 1790, I had proposed to a distressed Negro to try to whiten part of his skin with oxygenated marine acid air. He was to exhibit the appearance if it should be curious for the relief of his family. His arm was introduced into a jar full of this air, and the back of his fingers lay in some water impregnated with it at the bottom of the vessel. It was perceived that he had ulcerations from the itch between his fingers, and this made me very cautious about the experiments. In 12 minutes, he complained of severe pain from the ulcers, and the arm was withdrawn. The back of his fingers had acquired an appearance as if white lead paint had been laid upon them, but this did not prove permanent. A lock of his hair was whitened by this acid. Next day, the ulcers became extremely painful, and the hand swelled from the inflammation. This deterred him from continuance of the experiment after he was cured of his complaint." End quote. Now, some scholars have made reference to this experiment. Few have viewed it as an example of how anti-blackness informed the process through which data about race was produced. Fewer still have viewed this as a case in where a black person's body became the apparatus to test out technologies designed to literally eradicate blackness. That a white physician could test out the powers of acid by seeing if it could permanently whiten the skin of a Negro and then casually broadcast it was a true testament to the ways in which anti-blackness peacefully coexisted with the production of scientific knowledge. Equally important to consider is that this opportunity presented itself because of a cultural milieu that deliberately marginalized black people because of their skin color. Even if Beddoes' desire to remove black skin was seen as a way to challenge the system of slavery that invested so much in skin color as a mark of servitude, it was still premised on the assumption that the problems black people faced were due to their bodies, not white attitudes about them. It is worth noting that this experiment and the others performed were hardly a secret, for he described them in vivid detail in the third edition of Considerations in the Med Medical Use and Production of Factuous Heirs. Now, I'll just conclude briefly. As tempting as it is to dismiss the logic of Beddoes and Rush as a kind of archaic racism, the current medical discourses around black people's bodies that continue to traffic in damaging generalization forecloses on such action. Black people's bodies continue to be subject to assumptions that emphasize their supposed peculiarity. One need no, look no further than the 2016 study by Hoffman et al. on racial bias in pain assessment published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. This study's principal investigators found that, quote, many white lay people and medical students and residents held false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites. The study also revealed that, quote, racial bias in pain perception is associated with racial bias in pain treatment recommendations, end quote. Finally, it showed that, quote, false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites continue to shape the way that we perceive and treat black people, 
It should be noted that some of the beliefs that Hoffman studied were, quote, the belief that blacks have thicker skins than do whites, or that black people's blood coagulates more quickly than white people's blood. Now, naming the problem in American medicine, as Hoffman does, is a start to understanding how <coughs> anti-blackness continues to operate. But as the examples of Rush and Beddoes lay bare, the problem of anti-blackness in scientific discourse is deeper than that. It's worth noting that the views located in Hoffman's studies bear an uncanny and sinister resemblance to 18th century views on black people's pain tolerance. The uncritical sharing of information from authoritative sources is a phenomena that we must bear in mind when we try to make sense of how it is that present day respondents to Hoffman's survey still hold such patently false views about black people. There is no data to suggest that the respondents were citing Rush's medical writings as a point of origin for their wrong-headed views, but somehow they have managed to parrot views on race not too dissimilar from the 18th century. Um, so I just want to quickly conclude by saying um, that for Hoffman, she doesn't seem to think that this is racism at play. Quoting her, she says, racial bias and perceptions of pain is likely not the result of racist individuals acting in racist ways. But to date, I think that we might need to reconsider that, because if this is the case, how do we start to account for the continued damaging view of black people's bodies as distinctive as peculiar? Why the continued receptiveness to the idea of black bodily distinctiveness? And in this regard, I think that we might be able to view Rush and Beto's attitudes towards black skin as the antecedents of damaging discourses around blackness that we find in contemporary medical discourse. They are examples of how, in the pursuit of naming, parsing, and ultimately controlling bodies, material and textual subjugation can appear as intended or unintended byproducts. The assumptions that there were some as yet unnamed but well-defined source of innate difference between black and white people mm. undergirded a good number of 18th century medical and scientific texts, even those not explicitly about race. In these texts, assumptions about difference rather than sameness between black and white people's bodies, um, of the peculiarity of black bodies and the norm that and the belief that white bodies are the norms were alluded to, and they were always implied, but they were, and they were not necessarily stated explicitly, but as we can see, they were always very much present. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Dinah Ramey Berry from UT Austin, for those that came, that came in late. Um, I wanted to thank the conference organizers for inviting us to come and participate in this panel and um, to say that I'm, I've been enjoyed the conversation over the last day and a half and I look forward to the conversation we have following this panel. Um, I'm presenting some new material today and I'm interested in how it might contradict, which has been difficult for me to write it because it's kind of going against um, some of the ideologies that we were talking about that I actually buy into. So we'll see how this goes. But, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the heart of winter in 1815, Julia Richards, a 45-year-old quote-unquote poor black woman, set out on a 117-mile journey from Carlisle, Pennsylvania to Philadelphia. I'm going to show some pretty graphic slides, so I wanted to warn you. Um, it is likely that she traveled, it is likely that she traveled through Harrisburg, Lancaster, just south of Interstate 76 today. She may have winded her way along parts of the Susquehanna River for nourishment or by boat to ease travel by foot. It was a nearly 40-hour journey in February. Although we do not know much about her trip, we know more about why she took what we know more about why she took it and where she went. Julia came to Philadelphia to seek medical care. She wanted to have this large tumor removed by Dr. John Singh Dorsey a UPenn graduate who performed the surgery on the 22nd of February in 1815. The operation took 28 minutes, but Dr. Dorsey changed Julia's life because the tumor had been growing for 18 years. As you can see, it was quite large. Two feet, 10 inches at the neck at the top of it, three feet, 1.5 inches wide at its thickest part. According to Dorsey's notes, quote, the narrowest part of the tumor was thicker than her body. Surgical notes also suggest that the tumor, quote, and this just goes to what Dr. Hogarth was saying, never caused her any pain. I beg to differ. But the, quote, inconvenience from it was very inconsiderable, as he says. 
I'd like to pause on that for a minute just to think about some of the, the reflections that Dr. Hogarth said and thinking about the contemporary moment in history. And I actually was going to cite the, the study that you just talked about. Um, and it was also published in U, uh, UVA Today about the April 2016 study. Um, and looking at this idea of bias among tr uh, medical treatment and also pain management among African Americans. I would suggest that here, even a, a, a generation later, um, a few years later from the physicians that she's talking about, some of these doctors that I'm talking about today were trained um, around the same time or just after Rush. Um, so this is that next generation up in the early 19th century. Some of them were sitting at the same table in circles. So there's, there's lots of connections between physicians, which I know that you guys have all talked about with the Penn and Slavery Project. So I want to talk a little bit about the physicians, Dr. Dorsey. Dr. Dorsey was a young medical prodigy who received his degree from UPenn in 1802. He later became chair of Material Medica and Anatomy at, at Penn. Um, he was a student of Dr. Uh, Physic, which I'll talk about in a minute, and he received his degree at 19 years old. Um, the artist that did this picture of him is Thomas Sully, who I will also return to in a moment about this portrait. Dr. Philip Singh Physic was also a major physician here. Um, he got his BA in, in 1785. He got his MD at Edinburgh, some of the same physicians that where Rush was. Um, he was a professor of surgery here. He was a professor of anatomy, president of the, physical, uh, the Philadelphia Medical Society, and the first president of the, the, uh, the Academy of Medicine founded in 1797. So these are big dog physicians, and these are the physicians that Julia went to go see, okay? But I'd like to return to Julia's surgery. Dr. Physic, Dorsey's mentor, suggested that Julia take 40 drops of laudanum. And for those who don't know, this is opium, or the, the, mo the morphine slash codeine of the 19th or 18th century. He advised her to, quote, lay prone with the tumor elevated in order to lessen its quantity of blood. The tumor was laid, when the tumor was later emptied of blood, it weighed 25 pounds, and that's without the blood, okay? And it didn't bother her, right? She was in no pain. This 25-pound mass on her back that had been growing for 18 years. After about 4.5 uh, 4 hours of laying in this position, um, she was fatigued, and the doctors decided to slightly turn her to the left. At night, Julia took 30 more drops of laudanum, and, quote, she did not sleep the first night. Instead, she complained of little else than the fatigue of laying prostate. Um, during three days, after the, three days after the surgery on February 25th, Julia coughed, which caused considerable hardships. I can't imagine after being opened up and having that kind of a tumor removed, um, the sutures and everything else there, what, what a, a slight cough might do to her. On the 27th, her first dressings were removed, and the doctors tended to, quote, a considerable amount of fluid, quote, that discharged from her back. They dressed her wound and, and noted that they suggested that the, quote, patient was pleased upon a tonic treatment. Now, this is the end of what we know about Julia's trip to Philadelphia. We do not know when she was released from the hospital, if she returned to Carlisle, how different her life was after the surgery. And we also don't know questions about why she came and how she found out about the physicians here. Did she know about Dr. Dorsey and Dr. Physic? Did she have travel companions that went with her? How much was the surgery and who paid for it? Especially since we know that she was described as a quote unquote poor black woman. It appears that she received good medical care, which kind of goes against what we're talking about. Um, but would she agree with that? Like I wonder if we had her story, this is all we have is the lecture notes. Would her story say the same thing? Would she say she was cared for, she was comfortable, and the only pain she had was when she was laying with her tumor facing up? Instead, her story reveals more questions about the role of UPenn and physicians who perform surgery at Pennsylvania Hospital and history of the 19th century medicine and the medical profession, but it also brings up more questions about placing Julia in the context of medical history and the context of black women's history. Rebecca Williams. Three years after Julia's surgery, another black woman sought medical treatment in Philadelphia. Rebecca Williams was admitted to Pennsylvania Hospital in the summer of 1818, described as, quote, a young black woman, healthy. Um, she came because of two small pimples behind her ears, grew into one-inch tumors. Dr. Joseph Parrish, who also received his MD from UPenn in 1805, rest, um, took care of her and was, was the person that did the surgery. She rested for about 10 days after the operation, from what I can tell, but she was kept in the hospital for nearly a month before being discharged. 
So why am I telling you these two stories about doctors and their patients? And why am I interested in Julia's and Rebecca's stories? It's because I'm work currently working on a book with Dr. Callie Nicole Gross called A Black Woman's History of the United States. And in this book, we're trying to tell stories of women that we may not have heard about, we may not have read about in other stories. They might have been in the archives but never made it into history books, stories like Julia's and Rebecca's, to try to reveal some, uh, some aspect of African American women's lives. And it comes right into this conversation about the medical profession. So that's why I was interested in them. But one of the things that really struck me about both women was their portraits. These images of them, these drawings, were buried in medical records, in medical archives. Here are images of black women sketched in the 18 teens, and they're not caricatures. Their eyes aren't bulging, their lips aren't colored red or looking large. Um, I, mean, I have no idea what they look like, but these don't look like some of the caricatures that we saw in this time period. They're depicted with detail and features in a, nat in a natural form, very different from the images that we typically see of black women at this time. So I started doing research on the artist. I was trying to find out who the artist was. And what I learned, um, and if I'm, I'm still confirming some of this, but from what I can tell, the artist was a gentleman that some of you may be familiar with, Thomas Sully. Um, this is a picture of him in the late 19th century. But Sully was one of the most premier portrait, uh, portrait artists of the 19th century. Um, and I'll quote from the National Art, Art Gallery's website, although he painted many of the most prominent politicians, clergymen, and military heroes of his day, he is most known for his exaggeratedly elegant and idealized portraits of fashionable society women. That's from the National, Gar National Gallery of Arts website. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that, that Rebecca and Julia would have been described as such, but you can tell that he took very careful um, detail in drawing their, their pictures. And, one of the, and this goes into this question that I've been interested in, is looking at the ways in which the medical profession worked hand in hand with the art world um, and artists and training artists on drawing human bodies and making sure that they're doing accurate drawings depicting the medical conditions that people had. So not only in the surgery or in the anatomical theater were their doctors and their students, there were also artists from local art schools here that were trying to learn how to, how to craft and draw the human body. I found it ironic the that the fact that this artist, the artist of both of these women, was the artist of both of these women. He also was the artist of the picture that I just showed right here of um, Dr. Dorsey. He was also friends with these gentlemen, these physicians. So there's a, quite, a tight circle here of all these people and how they know one another. And I'll show you the picture there again. So um, one of the things that reminded me when I saw, when I was struck by Thomas Sully's work, was an artist who I very much admire. She's deceased now, but the work of um, Elizabeth Catlett. Mm -hmm. This is a bronze uh, sculpture of a woman that to me resembled Rebecca uh, in a way that was just striking. Um, the hair, braided, the braid in the front of the hair, although there's a part, but just even the contours of the face, the shaded, the eyes. Um, the nose is a little bit different, but there's just some aspects of the craft of this artist's work that you can see in a contemporary, who's now deceased, but a contemporary artist and then someone from the 19th century. So you can tell these are very skilled um, artists that are doing this work. <clears throat> so one of the reasons why I started doing work um, in medical archives, so this is just a sort of a side note how I came to this, and this has been a sort of a distraction for the last uh, six or seven months now, is that I finished a book, as she mentioned, The Price for the Pound of Flesh, The Value of Enslaved from Womb to Grave in the Building of a Nation. And um, the last chapter of that book, chapter six, um, looked at this uh, history of what I call the domestic cadaver trade, which was this uh, underground market of, of bodies that was being traded and sold to medical schools such as UPenn and other, many, of, uh, many other institutions here in the United States. Um, and so one of the things I found in doing research here, um, I actually added three years of time to write this book because I really wanted to finish this chapter and I felt like I couldn't stop. The study was about the commodification of black bodies and how black bodies were commodified through all life cycles, from, from before they were born until after they died. And the after they died part was this cadaver trade. And so I thought, I can't, I can't end the book at death. I need to end the book at when their bodies are no longer commodities. And so that's when I started writing about the cadaver trade. And I spent three years in archives, a lot of them here in Philadelphia, also Harvard, um, and other ar archives in Massachusetts, Vermont, um, throughout the United States. And um, I'll just show you some of the types of um, 
some of these, this is just a slide here of how, for me, Philadelphia was sort of the hub at the time of medicine, although New York was another hub, but Philadelphia was a hub where a lot of physicians came through here at different points. Um, they were trained here. And I have another, another very long list, and I even brought my, my this is the nerdy historian in me, but I brought my, my little Excel file of all the physicians that I was tracking and seeing what schools they went to and who they trained and who their students were. So I was doing like this academic genealogy of, of, of the, how, how, how all these physicians are connected. And when you start to see those connections, you start to understand why people are doing some of the same practices at other institutions that may seem like they have no connection to one another. Um, so this is what, why, for me, Philadelphia was the city of medicine, um, because of all of these schools. And there's a number of others that are small medical colleges, um, anatomical theaters that were here at the same time. So here's this one example of, of a black cadaver that appears in the, the records of Jefferson Medical College, which was down the street from here. A Negro boy, he was, they, they, they paid uh, $3.10 for his cadaver. Um, what I found in the research was the bodies of in, in formerly, some formerly enslaved and some free blacks were anywhere from $8 to $30 deceased. So that's not the same value that they were, they were cost, that they cost during their lives as enslaved people, as workers. Um, where that cost in today's money was can be anywhere from thirty to two hundred thousand dollars in today's money. Um, so this is just one like this was a research find that when I come when I came across something like this, it was evidence that they were purchasing black bodies and bringing them into the medical schools. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just one of the files. And you know sometimes you're digging for days before you find something like this, but they are here. Um, and then finally, one of the things that I wanted to think about too is, you know, blacks are not only on the table. Um, they're also in the room, and here's an image of a black woman, an unnamed black woman. Um, I think this is from this is from the late 18, um, 1890s, so it's after slavery. Um, but we're thinking about what what is this woman's role? She's got probably a broom or a mop. Um, these are what I would call medical laundresses. You know, what does it mean to be a seamstress or a laundress that's working at a medical school, washing the rags, cleaning the rags, scooping up the the mess from the, the dissection? She looks, in some of the images, you can't tell right here, but some of the pictures I've seen of black women that are standing there with mops look mortified. You know, they don't look like they want to be there. Um, but this is just another form of, of this, this history that I think we need to talk about and we need to uncover. Um, how do we tell the story of this woman? How do we tell the story of Rebecca and Julia? Um, was this woman, we know that this woman right here was probably not enslaved because this, is, this picture was taken after slavery, but how did she labor in this setting? Now, in closing, I want to end with just a few, um, just a few things I want to say about the project here, because I was very happy to be invited to be involved. And I wanted to just commend the students that are doing the work um, and commend, um, to commend all the faculty members and other students across campus, not just in history, but also in the race and society program and also in engineering. And, and you have students that you're going to be working with in computer science. So it's a university initiative, and I think that's wonderful. Um, and I just want to encourage you to continue to tell the whole story because that's what you're doing. Um, I read the student reports on the website. Um, in particular, Caitlin Doolittle's report she talks about in a preliminary summary from, from 2017 about not to lose sight of the humanity of the individuals. And I was so happy to see that um, because for so long, and we see this with the records that um, the medical records, black people are often objectified, they're treated as objects, um, and they're not really treated, or they're treated as human subjects, but we don't really think about them as human. Because I'm interested in Jessica and Rebecca. I want to know what happened after they left. I want to know, did she get back to Carlisle, Pennsylvania? What was her life like? After, has anyone even looked to see if she made it back? Has anyone looked at city directors or other records to find out who she was, what she did, what was, what was her life like before? I'm interested in the full story. So I'm really, really happy that you guys are working on that here. So you guys are including stories about patients and about physicians. And you're looking at the medical profession as well. And I just continue to encourage you not to leave out any of the notations, whether they're marginal, side notations. Look at the threads, even if they lead to uncomfortable spaces and lead to a history that has not been disclosed. Create that history. There was no history of a domestic cadaver trade. I had to come up with the term to try to describe it. And I, I say to people all the time, that was just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more out there that I didn't even cover. I just wanted to try to create a framework so we could actually have a conversation and understand what this history means. So creating a narrative and never forget people like Julia Richards or Rebecca Williams, because without them, doctors who walk these halls would never have become the renowned physicians we celebrate today. Thank you. Oops.
to echo the thanks for being here, and it's, it's really been kind of stunning to watch the undergrads present their research. Uh, as someone, I started working on Penn's history in 2011 when I first came here, and I, I felt like I've learned so much today from the previous presentations last night, from like, I want to get home and write again. <laughs> And uh, I wanted to rewrite this paper beforehand, but I didn't have time, so. Um, and I would also like to echo, uh, I mean, you're all still here, so you probably are expecting disturbing language, imagery in this talk, but I'd, I'd like to put that out there that there will be some, and uh, thank you, though. In 1851, the medical department of the University of Pennsylvania student T.G. Henry asserted, quote, the coast of Africa, which so fatal to white is favorable to blacks, end quote. And in 1855, William Henry Daughtry, also studying medicine at Penn, noted that remittent fever had made, quote, intertropical Africa uninhabitable by whites, end quote. Finally, writing on the same subject two years later, another Penn student, Elliot Smith, inquired, quote, why does the Negro dwell in comparative safety on the coast of his native land? Providence placed him there. End quote. In these highly illustrative assertions, medical students invoked the increasingly transnational gaze of racial medicine in the antebellum United States. For students such as Henry, Daughtry, and Smith, defending the health of systematized white supremacy meant not only supporting slavery, but also considering the United States' nascent imbrication in global imperial and capitalist networks. In the middle of the 19th century, medical schools like Penn as I'm sure you're all becoming increasingly more aware, taught an image of Africa as inherently unfit for whites and a paradise for people of African descent. And these students' conceptualizations of Africa evidence the dawn of an era for racism in medicine that would bridge the medicine created in slave societies to that of the present. Peering beyond just internal questions of slavery and its survival, antebellum medical students at Penn and other medical schools also interrogated whether empire was sound health policy for the United States. Likewise, these students' forward-thinking internationalist racism illustrated how the foundations of racial medicine that were created under slavery would not die with emancipation, but rather they would flourish and grow as the United States became further enmeshed in the systems of global capitalism and empire. Today, I want to focus my comments on this period of transition mostly examining how one Penn medical student in the middle of the 19th century constructed, constructed notions of racial difference to justify not only domestic slavery, but also to grapple with a burgeoning American empire, even considering the genocide of people of African descent. Through an analysis of the student's thesis and the writings of major antebellum race scientists, I argue that racist, often pro-slavery ethnology represented the central basis for medical school's racial pedago pedagogies and set important groundwork for later medical approaches to imperialism. During this period, American slaveholders held imperialist designs on Cuba and Central America. Americans had just conquered Texas. And a global array of scientific collectors regularly, lent, regularly sent stolen human remains to racial scientists in metropoles around the world like Philadelphia. In short, during this period, American racism, science, and politics were beginning to take a self-consciously global turn, and this would deeply influence how medical students imagined and described the, people of bodies of the, the bodies of people of African descent. As well as an in-depth analysis of a thesis by one Penn student in the 1850s at the end of my talk, I'll briefly illustrate how the Darwinian Revolution did little to change racial pedagogy being taught to medical students at Penn. By considering the, the curriculum after Darwin, I argue that the racist foundations of American medical education that derived from the slave system persisted well after emancipation and continue to shape the medical profession both domestically and abroad. As a result, studying the pernicious relationship between medical education and slavery represents an opportunity to examine the origins, the problematic racial medicine of the present. In many ways, medical professors and students' imperialist racial visions mirrored changes occurring in American culture more broadly in the 1850s. They illustrate how the boundaries of American racial thinking have been expanding, tracking alongside the increasing globalization 
of American imperialism and capitalism. As historian Charlotte Fett explains about this political frame, quote, despite US historians' tendency to tell a domestically focused story of the of 1850s sectional politics, American newspapers in this period covered all aspects of the clandestine transatlantic slave trade, end quote. Here, Fett is discussing the, discussing the growing popularity in the 1850s of what she calls slave trade ethnography. But the same could be said about medical literature on race. Like Fett, other scholars such as Manisha Sinha, Gerald Horn, and Matthew Karp have emphasized that as much as the sectional crisis over slavery might have caused some political actors to focus on domestic debates, it also led many others to contrive of new imperial schemes to preserve the slaveocracy in the Americas. Whether discussing exporting enslaved African Americans to Brazil or reopening the transatlantic slave trade, white antebellum Americans increasingly understood American slavery and racism as a part of an international array of economic and political forces. Building upon analysis of this broader discursive shift in the antebellum period, medical students and professors also began to depict the relationship between race, health, and biology on a global scale and they believe their research could shape the future of slavery, as well as the United States' potential evolution into an imperial power. Few students better illustrated this evolving worldview than Penn student from Alabama, J. Ramsey McDowell. And McDowell's thesis is actually on display right now, for, to display its horror, um, in a room right back there. So I would urge you to go uh, take a look. Um, it really gives a kind of captures what these students were thinking in a, the worst of it. Um, so in his 1855 thesis on the supposed inherent racial differences between white and black people, McDowell marshaled evidence from imperial data on the health of whites in Africa to prove that God created African descendants for labor in the tropics. McDowell explained, quote, the fatality which has befallen exploring expeditions of the African continent and the missionaries who have confined their labors to the coast of the same country, plainly shows that the white man was never designed to be an inhabitant of that land. And furthermore, the observation and experience of the medical profession of this country, supported by census returns, have led to the conviction that the black man cannot live with immunity from disease to an equal degree with the white population in the northern limits of the United States. And all this is scientific law." End quote. To summarize, McDowell, like the other three Penn students who I opened with, argued that black people were only healthy in the tropics and by extension when enslaved and working on plantations, and whites were healthiest in the temperate zones. And uh, I'm not sure how McDowell explains the upcoming genocide or disappearance of people of African descended people while whites cannot inhabit Africa, but that the um, discontinuities are, are difficult to uh, completely wrap your head around. Um, okay. So when McDowell discussed race and environmental health beyond the borders of the United States, he evidenced the influence of the Alabamian Josiah Knott, mm -hmm. who in addition to being a Penn medical grad and racial scientist, in 1859, Knott would go on to found what is now the University of Alabama at Birmingham's medical school, mm -hmm. although it was originally in Mobile where Knott lived. In his work, Knott employed a wide swath of print medical records from European empires using these sources to argue that the supposedly healthy condition of black people in Africa served as proof of the salubrity of American slavery. In what appeared to be serendipity for white supremacist slave owners like Knott, as a subtropical space, the Deep South had both health features of the tropics and the temperate zone, making it a perfect space for white owners to oversee an enslaved African-descended labor force. In addition to the popularity and wide distribution of Knott's printed scholarship, Knott maintained close relationships with professors at Penn and other Ivy League medical schools. In Knott and his often collaborator George R. Glidden's 1857 tome, Indigenous Races of the Earth, for example, contributors included Penn's anatomy professor Joseph Leidy and Harvard's sci Harvard scientist Louis Agassiz, who has been in the news recently for the disturbing photos he took of enslaved African descendants in South Carolina. Through his scientific works on race, Knott helped shape medical education's approach to race, mm 
and McDowell particularly echoed Knott's comparative geographic framework. In the, his thesis, McDowell not only discussed race in a US context, but he drew on examples about race and health from Finland, the Cape of Good Hope, and Egypt, among others. Thus, students like McDowell illustrated not only how racial scientists were beginning to think about differences in relation to broader geographic frameworks, but also how students adopted the global frames being taken on by American race science. McDowell did not just learn about racial difference from popular science. Instead, as McDowell revealed in his thesis, racial difference, as I'm sure you've, you've figured out by now, was a routine component of Penn's anatomy curriculum. McDowell related that, quote, Professor Joseph Leidy stated to the class that the characteristics by which naturalists distinguish between certain species of lions and tigers were indeed less and not more important than those between the white man and the Negro. And yet, he says, no naturalist ever thought of calling them the same animal, end quote. Both McDowell's thesis and the ideas of Leidy, his professor, unveiled the incestuous intellectual networks shared by physicians and racial scientists. McDowell also used skull measuring to prove the inherent differences between white and black people, or supposedly, obviously, uh, and he heavily relied on the writings of the recently deceased and renowned Philadelphia ethnologist, Penn Medical School grad, in addition to his work at Penn, was also the anatomy professor at the neighboring Pennsylvania Medical College, Samuel George Morton. Morton depended on George Glidden, Knott's future collaborator, for skulls from northern and to a lesser extent southern Africa. During much of the period when Morton assembled his collection, Glidden served as vice consul for the United States in Egypt, further illustrating the ties among American foreign entanglements, the production of scientific knowledge, and the racial curriculums of antebellum medical schools. As vice consul, Glidden collected hundreds of skulls from Morton. Throughout this period, European empires were intervening in the affairs of African states with growing regularity. For example, while Egypt, under the leadership of Muhammad Ali, grew independent from the Ottoman Empire, they also came under greater influence from Britain and France. More specifically, Western European empires all uh, viewed Egypt and the Suez Canal, which they would later construct, as a potential means to increase their influence over Asia and the Indian Ocean world or East Asia and the Indian Ocean world. With all of this, it was little surprise that Egypt represented an important collection center for Morton in his project to turn Philadelphia into a global center of racial science. Moreover, Morton's collection, and by extension, J. Ramsey McDowell's thesis, would not have been possible without the growing empires and their violent expropriation of people that allowed American and European physicians to steal human remains murdered by empires from across oceans and continents. Echoing Morton, particularly his 1844 work, Crania Egyptica, McDowell explained in his thesis that the entirety of Africa, quote, may be called the land of Negrodom, with the reservation of Egypt, the birthplace of arts and civilization, end quote, which is somehow, in all these white supremacist minds, Egypt is Europe. Doesn't make any sense, but, um, McDowell then explained, quote, Dr. Morton, by measurement of many crania, has shown that the cranium of the Negro contains nine cubic inches less than the white man. Like Knott's writings on the environment, race, and disease, Morton and his skull collection oriented much of medical students' transnational approach to race and the anatomy of the skull. And McDowell's parroting of Morton revealed the degree of racial scientists' influence on medical thought and pedagogy. McDowell was far from the only physician or student influenced by Morton. Before his death, Morton was probably the single most important figure in shaping how physicians talked about blackness. Mm -hmm. And he even made casts of 10 representative racial skulls for purchase by universities and medical schools, such as Harvard's Medical School mm -hmm. and the College of South Carolina. And these guys always brag about their statistics, but then they reduce it to 10 representative skulls that everybody yeah. can look at. Um, <laughs> so through selling supposedly representative racial skulls to other schools, Morton further helped create a national pedagogy of race, which countless students like McDowell would parrot. For much of the rest of his thesis, 
McDowell asserted the now well-worn fallacy that Africa had no great civilizations or history, uh, which still obviously holds sway as Steve King opens his mouth every other week to say this. Um, and, and building on this line of thinking, McDowell then gave an extended discourse meant to denigrate the black leadership of the US colony in Liberia. Mind you, this is his final assignment for medical school. Um, arguing with those who praised President Joseph Roberts as evidence of African descended people's capacity for intellectual achievement, McDowell asserted that Liberia, quote, from its foundations has been under the supervision of some of the ablest American intellects, and he doesn't say it, but he means white, um, and all of its prominent men are of mixed blood, end quote. Thus, all within the purview of his medical school dissertation at Penn, McDowell advocated for white supremacy, relying on supposed notions of environmental health, anatomical distinctions, and racist imaginaries of Africa not even gleeful predictions of the extinction of people of African descent went beyond the purview of McDowell's medical research. He concluded his dissertation with the exclamation that in future histories of Africa, historians will only be able to say that, quote, the Negro was born, he was wretched, he died, end quote. That's literally like the last sentence of his thesis. Uh, um, uh, McDowell not only was not the only student to ever support genocide either. Putting his assertions, aspirations of genocide more broadly, one medical college of the state of South Carolina student, R.N. Chavez, assertedly, ass asserted triumphantly in his thesis that soon Europeans would exterminate all non-white people globally. There was nothing subtle about McDowell or Chavez's racism while most students that discussed race in their senior theses, including the hundreds at Penn, did not traffic in pro-genocidal discourse, McDowell and Chevis evidence the extreme end of the spectrum of acceptable medical theory of race. One could hardly say that blatant support of genocide was a core ideological tenet of Penn's medical curriculum, but nor could you say that it was not an acceptable subject for a student to write about in their thesis along with oral exams, was the core system of evaluation at Penn's medical school. And McDowell's discussion of race in terms of environmental health, anatomy, and imagined history did typify Penn's medical curriculum. Four years after McDowell graduated, Darwin published his theory of natural selection. And two years after that, the United States went to civil war over slavery often depicted as a period of titanic shifts in both the history of science and racial politics. In Penn's racial curriculum, little would change from these two revolutions. Joseph Leidy, the anatomy professor who McDowell quoted, remained at his post through the 1880s. He's, he was a unionist, vague opponent of slavery, and one of the first major scientists in the US to embrace natural selection. Yet his lectures on race across his career hardly changed. And you can look at them at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Accepting natural selection did not dampen his belief that people of African descent were anatomically distinct from white people and intellectually inferior. Likewise, students continued to write dissertations that used medicine to prop up white supremacy. In his 1874 thesis, Penn student and Philadelphia native Hollingsworth Neal wrote about the supposed anatomical peculiarities of black people. While the nation had abolished slavery and Darwinists had usurped polygenists, Neal's thesis closely resembled McDowell's in how he actually described the bodies of people of African descent. Repeating claims made by McDowell and countless other commenters before the Civil War, Neal argued that people of African descent had longer forearms, larger penises, and narrower pelvises. Moreover, Neal, a Philadelphian, evidenced the power that white medical students held over local African-Americans' bodies, describing a scene that was disturbingly reminiscent of accounts of enslavers purchasing people. Mm -hmm. Neal asserted, quote, upon the inspection of the black man, as he stands before us naked, we are struck first with the color of his skin, the skin and its appendages, end quote. Worth noting, people of African descent as living, feeling, and thinking agents were completely absent from Neal and McDowell's theses probably unsurprisingly. Neil gave no sense of what this universalized, quote, black man, 
end quote, thought as the student analyzed him naked. Undoubtedly, though, encounters such as this between Penn students like Neil and the black population in Philadelphia brought significant and enduring damage to African Americans' relationship to Penn and the medical profession. So what do we make of this? And I'm, I'm sure I'll be echoing the kind of conclusions of my co-panelists. Uh, first, after emancipation, racism and racial violence did not casually slide out of medical, medical education. Before the Civil War, racial medicine was already being framed to fit a variety of medical, social, and economic paradigms in addition to slavery. Likewise, the postbellum curriculum on blackness at Penn closely approximated what students learned in the antebellum era. Second, before emancipation, physicians already were shaping medicine to be able to be used to facilitate the profitable exploitation of non-white laborers the world over, from the cotton south to West Africa to South Asia. White doctors were shaping medicine to justify the exploitation of unfree non-white laborers globally. In this sense, the racial medicine that slavery wrought was deeply modern, and in the most basic sense, it continues to function well in our contemporary system of global capitalism, whether it be evidenced by the unequal health outcomes of impoverished people of color in the United States and some not impoverished, the way in which some medical schools and students continue to peddle the notion that people of African descent experience less pain, or the disproportionate burden put on people in the developing world to serve as test subjects for the latest drug trials. And these people are not given the same informed consent that we are. And these are the same places where people are coming from the slave trade, from the indentured trade, are testing our drugs. Um, finally, theses like McDowell's and their legacy serve to remind us that the racist medicine born out of Atlantic slavery continues to not only shape inequality domestically, but also globally. Thank you. told you it was going to be a rich discussion. And I'm so pleased with how our speakers on this afternoon's panel took some of the themes that the students began with today and uh, moved with them in new directions, uh, both, I think, reinforcing what we heard, but also some new directions. And I just want to take a moment to highlight some of the themes that came out of the discussion, uh, and then see if the panelists want to engage at all with, if you've got anything you want to say about each other's uh, presentations. And then uh, we, we've got 25 minutes uh, to um, uh, engage now with discussion about the paper. So uh, let me just point out some themes that uh, stood out for me, and I'm sure you all uh, noticed as well. Uh, beginning with Shawande Mustakim's talk, this the idea of blackness as a threat of contamination. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, what I'm going to want to highlight is themes that we see in modern day medical practice and biomedical research and other forms of research as well. This idea that if you have any trace of blackness, mm -hmm. that's a sign of pathology and it may contaminate the rest of society and therefore has to be fixed or stamped out. Uh, we see that in research and policy today. Uh, the slave ship surgeon, remembering that medical professionals were critical to the slave trade from its very inception, from the very first time a ship mm -hmm. captured, took captured Africans and brought them across the ocean there had to be doctors involved in, in, in all sorts of, in trying to keep them alive, but also discarding them if they were a threat to the profits that were going to be made. Um, Rana Hogarth uh, points out that blackness was seen as a problem that needed to be fixed or examined, and that the research question was, what's wrong with black people, basically. And I have, if I say that almost every day, about contemporary research, that so much of the research industry today 
is what's wrong with black people and how can we fix them? Right. How can we fix their brains? How can we fix their genes? How can we fix their uh, bodies in some way? There, it's it. I I don't know how much of research is dedicated to that, but it's a huge portion, and millions and millions and millions of dollars are being spent on that question instead of what's wrong with U.S. society that causes all these problems. It's what's wrong with Black people's bodies, and I was so struck with how that came out in in your presentation, um, Dr. Hogarth. Also, when you said anti-blackness, I think I got this right, that you were saying that anti-blackness actually predates race. Yes. yes. And again, that's such an important idea. I have termed it as racism is, produces race. Race isn't a product, uh, racism isn't a product of race. In other words, it's not the case that they're natural races first, and then because of that, people become racist. <laughs> It's that racism created the need to classify people by race. It caused the invention of race, because if you want to be a racist and dominate other people, you have to manage them through a system, a classification system of race. And so I think that, that your insight that first came the desire to dominate and enslave black people and a whole way of thinking against black people and then Europeans had to create the system of race, which continues to be invented to this day, and pretending it's an innate biological difference when it's an invented political system. Uh, also, uh, the idea that these experiments on black people's bodies, including the horrifying experiment putting a black man's arm in acid, uh, that that is for the benefit of black people. Uh, I hear this all the time today, too. All race medicine benefits black people. Uh, that's why we have to practice it. Uh, this research on what's wrong with black people innately, well, it's for the benefit of black people. Uh, Samuel Cartwright said we have enslaving black people for the benefit of black people. Uh, and so those themes continue to this day. Uh, Dinah Ramey Berry uh, I want to emphasize in your talk the way in which you extended beyond some of the themes that we've been talking about, uh, the, uh, the black people who were not only on the table but also in the room. And that really, I think, brought up the question of all the black people that were harmed by the experiments that we may be focusing on, and that's important to focus on, but they're are other black people as well who witnessed them, who were affected by them, both physically affected by them, but also by the thinking that was perpetuated by it and other kinds of harms. And I really appreciate also your uh, entreating us ourselves not to treat the black people we're studying as objects. Mm -hmm. Let us not be mm -hmm. guilty mm -hmm. of treating the people we're studying as objects, make sure that we tell the full story and recognize the humanity of the enslaved people and, and people after the end of slavery who have been damaged so much by these ways of thinking. Uh, also, uh, how you said you extended your study to deal with the domestic cadaver slave trade, recognizing that the commodification of black people didn't end with death, it continued afterward. Uh, and then Christopher Willoughby uh, expanding this conversation even further to bring into account the global dimensions of it, uh, that uh, an internationalist imperialist uh, racism continued even after the end, well, beginning with uh, the era of slavery, but continuing past that, uh, and how the uh, medical curriculum, even after Darwin, continued to promote these ideas. Uh, so much of what you said, Dr. Willoughby, reminded me of the way in which even after the Human Genome Project mm -hmm. uh, supposedly confirmed that uh, to, to end this debate that race is not a natural genetic category, a natural division of human beings, yet it 
led to a spike in research looking for genetic differences between races, and uh, including ideas that sounded so much like the ideas that of uh, McDowell. Uh, the idea that black people evolved to be suited for tropical climates and white people evolved on different continents. Uh, I'm not making this up. This is the theory that many genomic scientists today are using to support race-based genetic research. It's that uh, after human beings uh, evolved for 200,000 years in Africa, so that we are all descended from Africans, different populations left and landed on different continents and evolved to be separate races. This is in, I'm, uh, this is in 2019 medical uh, and, and, and genomic journals. And so uh, I'll just, I just have to mention one example, which is Nicholas Wade, who was a chief scientific journalist in the New York Times, uh, who for about 20 years, uh, promoted this idea of three principal races and the need to uh, study the genetic differences between them to improve black people's health, of course. Uh, he ended up writing a book a couple years ago called A Troublesome Inheritance mm -hmm. on Race and Genes, where he claims there are three principal races. Now, this, is, this was all published in the New York Times, front page stories on it. And, uh, but now he puts it all together in a book but where he says that white people evolved in Europe to be democratic, uh, Asians evolved in Asia to be conformist and therefore have autocratic institutions, and black people uh, remain tribal and violent. Okay. Now, um, he, one time in the New York Times, full half page of the Science Times, he reported on a study that, uh, was similar to Morton's uh, racial skulls because they pick you know one tribe in Africa and say that represents all black people and they pick it up and then they come he compa they the study compared this one tribe in Africa to African Americans DNA and the theory was that the reason why people in West Africa do not have the rate of certain diseases that African Americans have is because after coming to the New World. African Americans evolved to have these diseases. I, I, I am not, but this was in the New York Times with a big picture of black people working in the fields and white people standing on the outskirts. Uh, and it said you know, African Americans e evolved, gene genetic change, genetic adaptation uh, explains the differences in disease rates of whites and, and African Americans. So uh, I think that, that was published maybe around, uh, it was in the 2000s anyway. So these, I, Nicholas Wade, Nicholas Wade, chief scientific journalist in the New York Times uh, and publishing this stuff for decades. Uh, and he left and wrote his book, A Troublesome Inheritance. So um, these ideas have circulated globally, and they are still the basis of a global conception of racial difference based on supposedly high-level advanced knowledge about genomics. And it just shows you that uh, the, these Racist ideas are so embedded in medical knowledge that they continue and they, they morph to adapt to the current, whether it's Darwin or the Human Genome Project, they morph to adapt to it, but they, the essence of it, which uh, I think our speakers highlighted so well, the essence of the anti-blackness, of the belief in white superiority, and the investment in whiteness, uh, the, uh, the, the notion of black bodies being pathological, and the idea that the problems of racial inequality in America, black people's problems, are a result of black people's innate deficiencies and pathologies. That it, it, it dominates, dominates medical practice and 
biomedical research and science gen broadly in the US today. So I really thank you for all bringing out those themes so, so brilliantly. Um, I want to leave time if there were some comments you wanted to make uh, to each other, or we can open it up to the audience. Okay, and then and probably that'll come out. Yeah. That'll come out. Okay, you always have your hand up first. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Someone who lives with HIV mm -hmm. and as someone who's black and queer and Muslim, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting this conversation about. I mean, one, the story that you shared of the woman who was like thrown into the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, that that yeah, that's gonna sit with me for a long time. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about surveillance, mm -hmm. like the surveillance piece. Because I, I mean, a lot of it was talking about pathology and kind of like white supremacy and medi medicalized ways. I want to talk about how like medical surveillance, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. is, is like a big part of this conversation around mm -hmm. white supremacy, um, and particularly because black people don't invest. I, I don't want to say categorically, but at least black people in my life, or at least groups of black people in my life, mm -hmm. don't invest in medical institutions. But we do invest, especially like black LGBTQ folk, invest in nonprofits, right? We invest in this idea that these organizations are grassroots, that these organizations are meant to serve us. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, nonprofits get left out of the medical conversation mm -hmm. when nonprofits are kind of pseudo-medical in a lot of ways, especially mm -hmm. prevention nonprofits or aid service organizations. Mm -hmm. A lot of that has to do with the connection to the early epidemic of HIV, right, and how people who were resistant to like not being seen or taken care of mm -hmm. kind of really fought for these resources in a lot of ways. Um, but what we don't talk about in that history is how a lot of black people were left out, how there's tons of like research to suggest that there was like black resistance to, to not getting funded uh, for treatment, et cetera. But you know, the narrative is that it was like white men mm -hmm. who mostly like fought for these resources and how now these institutions do participate in medicalized surveillance of black people, especially people who are HIV positive, mm -hmm. right? Tracking them, mm -hmm. making sure that they're on meds, mm -hmm. um, kind of coming to your house when you're not on meds, this happened to me, right? Um, and having a conversation with you about like how you are this, this purveyor of disease. And I want to talk a little bit, I want you to talk a little bit about like this <laughs> idea of a diseased like, black person, right? Because mm -hmm. that has a different kind of, um, the weight is different, right? Because if you talk about how black diseased people are talked about and mm -hmm. looked at as like monsters, like the, HIV, the myth of the HIV mm -hmm. monster, um, and the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up because Oprah kind of perpetuated that when she brought on the, uh, J.L. King um, to talk specifically about how HIV was being like given mm. to black women from like DL people yeah. um, and how mm. that became a narrative about like predatory, like these people who are pods who are predatory, right? Mm -hmm. Preying on black women when we know that 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 is so many different factors that determine HIV vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what, sense. yeah, let's let Dr. Mustaki <laughs> respond, and maybe other panelists want to respond as well. Okay. The idea of the diseased. Well, and also the whole, um, and thank you, um, yeah. and thanks to the whole panel. I'm so glad we're all together because then we can all dovetail mm -hmm. in, in, in interesting ways. But this whole idea of surveillance and medical surveillance, mm -hmm. um, I'm very fascinated by what people do when they think nobody's looking. And so when we get into even this whole isolated world of the sea world um, and being at sea and what people do, and then to have extended time um, with these people, with these bodies. And in fact, there's a story that I have in the book where one surgeon um, had commented that a black man had died, but he didn't know why. So that night, he waited until all of the captives on board were everybody was put down and gone to sleep. Um, 
in order for him to perform a surgery on this guy on the ship as it's going. And what was even more interesting was when he gave um, testimony before the British House of Commons, there was this question of, well, did you go into his head? Did you basically like try to look at, essentially trying to look at this black brain and you have all this access to this body, what did you do with it? So when I think about surveillance in that way, I'm really sort of thinking about the layers of it. And then of course, on the flip side, the um, availability of the water to hide your, you know, hide your discretions, which you've been doing. Um, but when we look at surveillance, you know, it, it definitely transcends time and space and it takes on different forms. And surveillance for black people is central. We're always being watched and gazed upon, mm -hmm. whether we're thinking about historically or more contemporarily. Mm -hmm. But when we think about power at hand and then the perpetuation of ideas. So if I were to go really quick, um, I didn't even realize until before I came that Samuel Cartwright had been educated here. What's interesting is that my students very well know him because of what draped to mania and diastia Ethiopica that became so central. So in that way, the surveillance then perpetuating and, and fully emboldening the violence that is enacted. It's okay, well, you must be crazy. Well, you know, whip them until, you know, they won't burn down the house or this or that. So it's, you know, we could speak even more deeply about it, but I want to let my other panelists go. And also, thank you just for sharing in that way. And that's also why I assigned Kathy Cohen's book in my medical history course, because we have to sort of really think about the HIV experience and how that evolves, and particularly for black bodies. So thank you. Okay. Hmm. Another question? I don't know if there are other responses or... Five minutes. Yeah, okay. Glenn Ellis, recognize you. Mm. Uh, I'm the seventh of nine children, and all six of my siblings went to Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my older sister was a dietitian who was an internship and had science books prepared at lunches for the men in the assistant oh, Wow. Mm, oh, my goodness. So I was born as a color baby. I grew up as a Negro boy in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. I was uh, accepted at the uh, Afro American Students. <laughs> the only thing now after traveling and learning more about the world is looking at African descent. Mm -hmm. But I think I just want to say real, real quickly, um, I suppose that I really appreciated your comments because with that kind of a schizophrenic background of, of identity, to really talk about how racism um, pre-existed race. Mm -hmm. And I think what I just mm -hmm. illustrated kind of mm -hmm. makes a case mm -hmm. for that. And how, at the end of the day, I think, for me at least, it's bet better to talk about white privilege as opposed to white superiority. Mm -hmm. Because I think the institutions of race, this medicine is really at the center of continuing to perpetuate, uh, perpetuate as you point out, Dr. Robinson, how in light of what the human genome project has clearly and conclusively established, they're still looking to try to find how to maintain this institutionalization of race. And so the commodification of black is what is really central in this whole kind of like mm -hmm. red and kind of going through this thing. So uh, thank you all for the enlightenment that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see a hand here. I can um, just say something about it during slavery real quick because um, there's a former student of mine who's now a professor, Dr. Jan Barclay. Um, she writes about, um, and has a book coming out about, uh, it's called The Mark of Slavery, and it's about dif being differently abled. And in, the, in her study, she found a number of places where they talked about enslaved people as being crazy or idiotic. Um, that, was a, that was a column in the census records at the time, deaf, dumb, blind, and idiotic was a column in the census records. And so she did research on that and 
then found in plantation records where enslaved people were described as having fits. And so the fits were these sort of episodes, and they could have really been about epilepsy, it could have been about them having a stroke, um, but there wasn't, that wasn't the term that was used, so oftentimes they were just sort of, oh, they're crazy. There's one woman, I don't know if she put her in the book, um, but I'm, I'm kind of an archive rat, so I find all kind of crazy things, and then I want to use them somewhere else. I don't remember if she used this, but um, there was a woman, I think her name was Mary, and they kept saying she was having fits. They brought her to a hospital, finally, because she was just making too much, she was being too disruptive of the, on the plantation. And um, they found that she had maggots mm. that were that had gone in her ears, mm. and it was making her, you know, just she was having trouble. Once they removed them, her fits stopped. So there's a there's that she could no that's something that they thought she was quote unquote crazy and that she had a mental health issue, but it re really was a physical health issue. So I think that there's a, there's a lot more space and room for more research on that, and a, and um, I think it's something that goes up into contemporary times. It is a stigma within the African-American community. I think today, um, Taraji Henson, Henson? Or that? Mm -hmm. I think I'm saying the actress from Empire. Yeah. Um, she just came out and talked about her issues with um, depression. And um, Catherine Zeta-Jones has bipolar disorder. So there's a number of people that are starting to talk about it. Once it becomes unstigmatized, I think we'll be able to address it a lot more. I would also really just want to suggest a book um, mm -hmm. protest psychosis, I see that Jonathan yeah. Metzl's coming. Yep. I have continued to use it to warn my students about you get outside the boundaries of social order, mm -hmm. then how an institution can def um, redefine itself on you. And so you, you, you try to stand up for civil rights and all of a sudden then you land in this insane asylum within Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, so I would highly offer that book. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one thing really, really um, super briefly, um, so the concept of mental illness um, within African descended bodies, um, I've actually found, if you look at this sort of from the era of the slave trade into slavery um, and in different contexts, it varies. So there are cases in which African um, bodies are considered to be um, far too um, basic to have severe sort of mental illnesses as whites. But then at the same time, there are specific kinds of diseases such as um, pathological dirt eating, mm -hmm. which is first conceived of as a form of mental disquietude. Um, I would actually argue that for Cartwright, um, uh, Rascality, mm -hmm. right? The Astia Ethiopica. Yeah. It's just rascality. The need to break um, tools um, to slow labor um, was constructed as some kind of like mental um, imbalance. But the issue is, is that I think at least for the period that I study, what I found is that this is actually an incredibly flexible and malleable concept of mental illness that is mm -hmm. like deployed to describe African American or African descended peoples mm -hmm. when it fits, when it suits, mm -hmm. and so that it's actually mm -hmm. a quite elastic um, concept. Yeah, there's a hand, oh, oh, I'm oh, sorry, go on, Chris. Also just kind of no, building on. on what Rana says is that also, I'm pretty sure it was a Penn medical student, I mix up my thousands of racist medical students <laughs> that I've read, but, uh, and it was a fairly common trope that if you came to the North, the cold weather oh, and the kind yeah. of intellectual stimulation of freedom <laughs> would send you into insanity. Right. Mm -hmm. Essentially a doctored thesis that says that I mean, not thesis, census, mm -hmm. that drastically more African-descended insane people in the North, yeah. not many, believe it or not, not many planters are mm -hmm. treating the mental illnesses of their mm -hmm. enslaved patients. So it's very underreported, I don't even think, covers what, what whatever insa insanity treatment mm -hmm. would have been in slavery. But I think you could also see some of that stigmatization already building in those discourses of the desire for freedom, the desire for autonomy yeah. is a sign of insanity. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to be amongst freedom will will further that uh, dementia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because African people need to be enslaved to be healthy. Mm -hmm. If you want freedom, you must be insane. Is exactly. basically exactly. that theory, and and it it upholds for the protest psychosis for mm -hmm. Samuel Cartwright. Mm -hmm. That that theme stretches from slavery to today. There was a hand in the back. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> 
with me? Um, so thank you, thank you for your question. Um, so I will, um, maybe I can start with sort of the idea of like sort of black peculiarity and then the idea of, of, of the, the stand-in, um, if you like. Um, so one thing to sort of um, bear in mind um, in sort of me thinking about the concept of peculiarity, and this kind of goes back to the idea of, of anti-blackness is not quite racism, the ability to sort of see and visualize like a black person is sort of different, is going on at the same time that people believe in humoral theory and different constitutions, that that what they observe, for example, in racial so-called racial immunities and saying, okay, this is a disease, for example, with yellow fever that should kill everyone, but black people, for some reason, are not dying in the rate that we are allowing ourselves to see, mm -hmm. sort of lays a foundation of saying that there is something that is internal, like something is yet un like not understood. But if you've already trained your gaze to say, okay, well, I can visually see difference. I now have heard about differences in immunity. You start to pick up on this idea of like peculiarities and pathologies. For example, the idea of sort of, of dirt eating is one in particular, um, drapetomania. There are certainly ser slave diseases, diseases that only black people can have, right? So you would think, okay, well, this is a peculiar race of people. Mm -hmm. How can we then use this as a body that's necessary for teaching um, and I would actually say what I found, at least in my own research, um, like archivally, is a sense of it's it's a cognitive dissonance um, that certainly pervades this. But I would also think, in thinking about sort of the ethos of medical training and education in the 18th century, and I would actually even argue like you could go earlier, mm -hmm. is that it, the body doesn't have to be like the, the same, right? It's a mo it is a practice. It's a model that you you work on to extract the data from, and when you're ready to go and practice on, let's say, a, a white person, you can still kind of tweak it, right? You know you would never, for example, bleed a delicate northern woman in the same way that you would bleed an enslaved woman, but you're still going to, you would have trained in that way, right? And so this is something that I think, um, it is kind of hard to wrap our minds around because it is a clear sense of wanting to have it both ways. <laughs> you want to have black pathologies, mm -hmm. you want to have black peculiarity, but you also want those bodies because it's going to help you train on other people. And so for me, I kind of have seen this as a a very much a, a sense of this cognitive dissonance that I think actually has deeper roots in sort of the 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 culture of medical education of sort of how you gain access to knowledge and then how you practice it. But I think we can't disaggregate that from the, the understanding of different constitutions. So I'd actually even argue very briefly that um, I think Deirdre Cooper Owens talks about this. Mm -hmm. J. Marion Sims practiced, experimented on enslaved black women. He did the same to Irish women when he goes up north. But he certainly changed his approach when it was time to treat paying wealthy white women patients, right? And this is, and we are seeing all of these, like the Irish were considered peculiar, enslaved women were considered peculiar, but I'm gonna use all of that data and I'm gonna practice on these wealthy elite, like white ladies. And that there was seemed to be no problem with that. So. I don't really have much to add, but except that there's, there's, you're gonna see hypocrisies within this history and contradictions, um, and I think that's one of them, where you're seeing black bodies as being um, anomalies, but then you're also seeing them being cut open to understand human medicine and, and, and human anatomy. Um, I remember one of the medical students' record I read, um, when they cut, they had some bla a black cadaver on the table and they cut open the body and they said, oh my gosh, the insides are the same. Like they were surprised by that. They expected and were looking for difference. And they said, oh, they, oh, they have one heart. Oh, okay. I mean, it sounds simplistic, but there's all these contradictions at this time, and I think it has to do with the culture of the moment that she just described as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would add two yeah. quick things. Uh, Joseph Leidy, the mm -hmm. anatomy professor, uh, kind of actually addresses this pretty head on at one point, and he says something along the lines of this, that he compares the differences between human races to the differences between this extinct horse and the modern day horse, is that it's just the curvature of one tooth that defines their speciation. Um, and that, I mean, why do you think there are more differences, but these are very small differences that create a kind of sum total effect. <laughs> and then second, this is also the era of vivisections, the beginning yes. of that. So yes. doctors yes. are constantly live dissecting animals mm -hmm. to understand how mammalian hearts, lungs, mm -hmm. work in motion. So there is a, a kind of intellectual mm -hmm. premise of basically what Rana and Dinah already said of that life is like, a, mammalian life is a spectral, uh, a spectrum mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. and you can learn from different types of mammals mm -hmm. how to operate on the pinnacle as they would have seen it. Mm -hmm. um, wow. 
Well, I think we're at the end uh, of this part of the symposium before we have a reception <laughs> and food. So uh, thanks to all of you, to our wonderful speakers, our student researchers, and stay tuned for more. Thank you.